Good afternoon and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Finance Audit and Budget Committee of the DeKalb County Commission. I am Commissioner Jeff Rader and I uh, chair the committee. I'm joined currently by Commissioner Lorraine Cochran Johnson and expect uh, Commissioner Larry Johnson uh, to join us shortly, but in his absence, I think we can still deal with the minutes of the April 18th uh, meeting. Commissioner Cochran Johnson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I have read those minutes from April 18th. I found no fault, so I would ask that they are approved as presented. Thank you. I'll second that. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Uh, meeting minutes are approved. Let's move to the uh, two um, grants that we're considering. Um, let's see. Uh, is there... Um, a presenter uh, to give us a brief update on these um, grants for uh, victims and witnesses. Ms. Fields, uh, did, are you the one that's speaking on this? Yes, I was trying to speak. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Um, I was on mute. <laughs> um, yes, I am equipped to speak on these grants. These are both very annual uh, annual grants that we get um, from CJCC, which is the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, as well as PAC, which is the um, Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia. These grants we get in one that is 212,000. This one takes care of our victim witness advocates um, department. It funds for four of our advocate salaries plus their benefits. And what we do is we add a 15% um, match to that, uh, which is I believe 65,000 um, that is already allocated from our um, surplus or transfer to grants accounts that we have every year in our budget. Um, and so moving forward for our um, programming, that's where that funding comes from. The $50,000 from uh, CJCC funds one salary for an attorney two position that's housed in our special units um, department, a special, I'm sorry, special victims unit department. Um, and this is someone who prosecutes, um, strictly prosecutes any high profile or um, uh, cases that involve uh, victims or violence against women. Thank you. And are either of these grants um, for a limited duration that would potentially um, uh, necessitate uh, further county effort beyond the match that is uh, required at this point? No. So each of the grants are um, on an annual cycle. One of, the, one of them starts October 1 and ends September uh, 30th. That is the um, $212,000 grant. Um, so it's just annual. It, and then the $50,000 grant is also annual, but it starts the fiscal year of January 1st through December 31st. Right. And then do you expect these to be, are these the type of grants that are uh, renewed on an ongoing basis or do they represent an initial um, investment that perhaps was competitively awarded that would uh, at some point terminate and, uh, you know, necessitate some additional level of effort? They're kind of twofold. So they are discretionary grants, so they are competitive. However, we do get them every year because there's money allocated to the states for this particular purpose, um, violence against women, so AWA, V-A-W-A, and the um, uh, Victim of Crimes Act. So the state gets those every year. They get a really large amount that is divided up in three years, both grants. Um, so for the course of three years, we get a portion of that. We still do have to apply competitively, but reasonably speaking, we do get these fairly regularly. All right. Thank you. Commissioners and uh, Commissioner Larry Johnson has joined us. Um, do you, either of you have any questions on 1459 or 1460? All right. Seeing no questions, I'd entertain a motion on both. Thank you. So, yes. And I will second. All right, so the motion is to uh, recommend approval of both 1459 and 1460, second by Commissioner Cochran Johnson. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand, say aye. 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 All right, those are our two agenda items. We can now uh, move to our updates. Uh, first on the agenda is on the audit response for our purchasing system process update, uh, Mr. Williams. Um, first, I guess, uh, perhaps um, we would let uh, the Office of the uh, Independent Internal Auditor, Mr. Campbell, I think, was sending oh. us a presentation. Do we want to let them make their uh, presentation and then your response? Ab absolutely. I think that's... Um... And I'm not sure he may have a presentation for the uh, purchasing system. If so, we would be happy to go after that. I was thinking that was a follow-up um, where we've already presented. We're going to have our uh, uh, outside consultant present. So, okay. but whatever you prefer. Mr. Campbell, do you have anything to set the stage with, or would you prefer to just go on uh, with their presentation? Uh, no, no, I prefer if not, Mr. Williams, go ahead with his presentation. Okay, very well. So That's yeah, so, so from a, from an audit perspective, there uh, you know it's essentially a, a follow up to determine exactly where they are at with the um, with the with that um, particular process. Thank you. Yes. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. What I would like to do, and actually we will have between our CFO, Ms. McNabb, um, and um, Lisa Williams, our treasurer, um, our controller. Um, kind of talk through and, and introduce uh, the gentleman from Nichols Colley. Uh, we presented about, I want to say six months ago, after the audit first came out, what we were going to do to take those findings um, that were presented in the audit and address the issues. Um, and there's been a lot of work done over the past several months. And so Mr. Michael Johnson uh, will do the presentation, but uh, uh, Lisa, if you would do the introduction. Um, you can talk a little bit about some of the work that has gone into getting us to where we are today um, and what we anticipate over the upcoming months. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Mr. Williams mentioned, we have been working for the past uh, two years on um, the response to an audit that we initiated. We initially asked the Office of Independent Auditor to assist us with assessing our accounts payables internal controls. And in doing that, they came up with a report. Um, they suggested these findings. And we have developed the responses to this over the past um, six months or so. I'm the meeting with meeting with department heads and end users to develop a comprehensive um, policy and procedure that will address all of the audit findings mentioned. Um, and Commissioner Rader, in response to what you asked earlier, the presentation that Michael Johnston is going to give us today is going to include that. It will include the original findings, and then it will give our corrective action responses and our action items for it for resolving them. So we have Mr. Michael Johnston, who is a partner with Nichols Cawley with us today, and he will give us the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I do have a, a presentation and I think, uh, Lisa, I think it, I sent it to you, but I can share my screen. You if, do have that capability, sir. Okay, thank you. Let me get to uh, sharing my screen. Uh, I selected the right one, good. So I'm moving the screens out of the way there. So thank you for the opportunity to, to bring an update to you today. And so I'll be happy to answer any questions you have going through, <clears throat> but my goal today is to outline where we started what we've done, where we are, and where we hope to get. So starting, here we go. So the background of, of how we got here, the finance department initiated a request 
to have uh, an internal control assessment performed. The Office of the Independent Auditor agreed to perform that and delivered that, um, I believe, in June of 2021. There were nine findings published as a result of the audit. Um, the Departments of Finance, Purchasing, Contracting, and Information Technology collaborated to develop responses, timelines, um, uh, initial thoughts on how to address the recommendations and findings. And as part of that, myself and my firm were engaged to provide expertise and assistance to the county in addressing the findings and to assist in um, a process of documenting the current processing activities for invoice processing and cash disbursements. So essentially, how does it happen? Identifying activities and actions of process improvement regarding the audit findings and recommendations. So taking how does it happen and uh, insert the findings and recommendations into how it happens to understand how those things are integrated in that process and to look at how the process works and how can we address those findings. Evaluate the feasibility of planned actions to address those internal control matters develop action plans and recommendations to address the findings coming from that process and the action plans, develop a standard operating procedure to uh, establish steps for the invoice payment and cash disbursement activities, and then to establish an implementation process of training personnel and communicating personnel regarding that standard operating process. So that's, that's our goal. And that's how we got here. As just as a reminder, and this came out of the uh, Office of Internal Audits report, um, as to how the the cash disbursement and invoice payment process flows, and the parties that are involved in that process. So, what have we done so far? So we've met with, uh, we've obtained and reviewed county documentation related to the invoice payment and cash disbursement process. We've conducted significant interviews and discussions with county personnel that are involved in the process uh, to include the finance department, purchasing contracting, information technology and county user departments. Uh, from those interviews and discussions, we have obtained multiple perspectives on how the invoice payment and cash disbursement process works and identified uh, implementation issues and a process to implement the, the uh, action plans that were developed. From those interviews and discussions, we've documented an outline of the invoice and payment cash disbursement process, identified potential action plan input areas, uh, coordinated with county personnel the identification of action plan matters to address them, and an accounts payable processing procedures document is in development based on all of the things that we've done so far. So to generally walk through, uh, there were nine audit findings, to generally walk through each of the audit findings and, and talk about our action plan, where we're going and what we're going to do, the, and looking at the audit findings, uh, the first finding was about data and information could not be validated. Information and reports could not be validated. And so there were several recommendations uh, specifically related, related to a data cleansing uh, with respect to certain accounts payable information. And so we've established an action plan, a uh, in this case, a three-point action plan to review existing information, review outstanding information, and establish a process. We've established an action plan uh, for a data cleansing activity process. We've established an action plan for monitoring. Uh, we've established uh, uh, a responsible party, which is the accounts payable department, and that process is in place. And I believe on this one, we have made good progress. If you have any questions, please feel free to jump in. I think my goal is to let you know that what we've done so far, that we've taken each finding and uh, dissected the finding, outlined the process, established action plans to address them. The action plans are in various stages of implementation. And through those action plans, we're developing a procedural document where, that we'll use for communication and training. 
Finding number two, address several missing monitoring controls. So we established an action plan to put into place uh, to evaluate standardized reports, customized reports, getting other parties, user departments, et cetera, involved in uh, evaluating monitoring processes. And that is in process of, of um, establishing those reports and looking at positions to be developed and persons that can review those reports. Item number three, the SMF management. The SMF is supplier master file. That is where information with respect to vendors is, is maintained. Uh, audit finding respect to uh, management and maintenance of it needing to be, uh, of the file needing to be addressed, establishing ownership of the file, a process for updating information within the file, and a, a process for establishing access controls. We've established an action plan where accounts payable and purchasing and contracting are establishing procedures uh, to, to provide for ownership of the supplier master file and also to establish a process for putting in place the purchasing advisory committee, uh, the development of the ineligible source list, uh, the development of a taxpayer identification number matching program that would be established for vendor approval uh, and looking at compensating controls in managing the supplier master file. We've established a responsible party, which is both purchasing contracting AP, and all of the things that we just mentioned are in development and will be included in the standard operating procedure document. Uh, finding number four, non-compliance with the county's conflict of interest ordinance. Uh, recommendation, finding that um, not all parties had documented compliance with the conflict of interest ordinance. We've established an action plan to train people with respect to the conflict of interest ordinance, conflict of interest ordinance um, for the, such documents to be included in proposals and written templates and for the COI documentation to be included in the I supplier module, which is part of the, of the county's um, 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 Oracle uh, accounting and um, management system. Our action plan status, we're in process of developing all of those things and the training associated with it and purchasing and contracting is the accountable action plan status party. Uh, finding number five, some invoice payment processing procedures not centrally located. Um, recommendations were to eliminate AP returning checks to, to user department for distribution to the AP. All invoices must be submitted directly to AP and notifying vendors and user departments regarding the implementation of those procedures. We've established an action plan for the AP department to establish procedures to train um, user department personnel, to train vendors and suppliers, and to provide procedures for invoices to be submitted directly to AP, to not provide checks to uh, user departments for payment to, um, um, uh, to vendors, and for vendor agreements to be reviewed uh, and templates to be reviewed to include such provisions. Excuse me, Mr. That's, Johnston and yes. Mr. Chair. I do see that we have some questions from uh, both Commissioner Larry Johnson and Commissioner Cochran Johnson. So let's go ahead. If uh, the questions are uh, specific to a particular part of the presentation, let's go ahead and take them now. Um, if they are general in their nature, we would wait, but um, I see the two hands up. So let's go ahead. Um, who's first, Mr. Kutelski? Uh, Commissioner Larry Johnson had his hand raised right. first. Mr. Johnson. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Johnston, can you go back to five? Finding four, I'm sorry. Yes, four, yes. Now, when you say they didn't fill out the conflict of interest form, is that a type of form you got you can fill out on the spot or do you have to go back and take some time to fill it out it's just something you check off so i'm just trying to figure out because sometimes the forms may be longer than just sitting up there and, and turn them in then somebody take them back and then forget to bring them so is that i'm just trying to see what was the reasoning so so your question is on the recommendation from the office of internal audit uh or they're finding that um that the forms were not completed. Right, I was trying to see what was the reasoning. Is it a long form that you had to go back and, and 
fill out or is it something that that the vendor or somebody supplier can fill out on the spot and try to do? Because some my, my, I can give you my observation is that it can be filled out on the spot. Um, okay. Okay. But, but, I, but I'd want to, but I'd want to defer if I could to the auditor who provided the recommendation and finding if they wanted to comment on that. So, uh, so commissioner, with this part, a particular finding now, as a part of the supplier application, the suppliers are required to complete a, a conflict of interest form to declare any conflict of interest um, that okay. they may have with the employee, you know, whether it be a family member or you know, any other um, potential conflict of interest that they may have. Now, one of the things we found during the audit was that there were a few suppliers that were registered where there were no um, conflict of interest forms on file or the forms were not you know, completely filled out, or instances where conflict of interest may have been indicated, but there was no evidence that the department did um, further investigation to determine the extent of the conflict. So you could turn in a form. How could you turn in a whole packet if you don't have it completed? You shouldn't be able to turn it in, right? So they wouldn't. <laughs> sure. I don't know how you can turn in a form if it's not complete. You get you you review it. And then you give it back to a, to the person. Say so you need to fill it out right. You sitting here. So some per, that means some people just took the form and just put it in the system. And then you you found out later it wasn't a they missed some uh, filling out some stuff. I don't know the process. I guess, and I don't want you to go into detail here. But it just seemed like if somebody get the application and reviewing it right there at the desk before that person leaves, most people review and make sure you signed off on everything. And then if not, you got to fill it out while you're sitting there. So that's not the case. You just, that's what you think. You know, um, Commissioner, the, the application process based on what we saw is, is online, it, you know, some, some applicants submit their applications online. It's subject right. to review before it's approved. So that is something where, you know, it, you know, you had a few instances where the forms were just not completed, but whoever the supplier was approved. To be right, that's what I'm saying. Approved. Okay, I just think we got to have a, a system in place when you, mm -hmm. even before you, if it's on the computer, you should have it set up that most people who have forms, if you don't fill out a certain form, you can't submit the application. So, yes, yeah. So, so, so the process that was explained to us was that once those forms are uploaded and submitted, they are subject to review before the suppliers become approved suppliers. So right. that is the official right. process that it should have been. Right. I just think you before you even submit it, if you don't fill out things that are required, you can't even submit it. So they're the computer oh, okay, system. Okay, okay, I understand what you're saying. I mean, in right. this in these cases, a lot of those forms were PDF forms that require the so, so they are not electronic forms. They oh, okay. are PDF forms that require the, the individuals to complete it, scan it, and upload it. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. I think there was another, another, okay. I think there was Commissioner another question. Johnson has her hand up. Yes. And uh, Commissioner Cox. Um, yes. yes. Thank you so much. And I understand Commissioner Larry Johnson's statements because all applications should be subject to review before approval, whether they're done in person or whether they go through a portal. And I just want to say that. What I'm of the belief, because I know that, that you know, across several departments in the cab, we are working with, shall I say, the best um, systems. I know that this is something that we are continually addressing. Mr. Johnson, you, Mr. Johnson your uh, system is acting up. We can't mm -hmm. hear you. Okay. Like a bug in it. Your audio is kind of vibrating, Commissioner uh, Cochran Johnson. I'm not sure why that would be on your end. Okay, is that better now that I'm not visible? Unfortunately, not. Okay. okay. In that case, I won't put you through my statements. I'll just continue to listen. Mr. Williams has his hand raised, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Williams. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I just want to emphasize to the points that 
both Commissioner Johnson's are making. These are excellent points. And this is exactly why we initiated this, you know, this, this study or this audit, uh, because we did suspect that there was areas in our system that either we need to update the process, modify the process, or uh, implement more and better training. So these findings, uh, obviously you always hope that you get a perfect score, but we would not have requested the audit had we thought we were gonna get a perfect score. Um, but now what we're doing is focusing on how do we, re, you know, how do we fix these things that were identified? And that's what Mr. Johnson was hired to do. Okay. Continue. Thank you, sir. I think we were on um, finding number six. Finding number six referenced um, invoices on hold, which are invoices presented or processed at a point through the uh, accounts payable processing function and are on hold for some reason. Uh, and those invoices not resolved, being resolved timely. Um, so a recommendation that finance and DOIT management work together to address the information in the invoice on hold report and to implement procedures to uh, see that fewer invoices go on to the invoice on hold report, uh, which, which, uh, which again is invoices that are um, stalled in the process of payment for some, uh, for some reason. And that for finance management to implement procedures to monitor the activity on that report to identify errors and inefficiency. And so our action plan, uh, identify the causes of the invoices being placed on hold, uh, develop procedures to address the cause and establish procedures to monitor the invoice on hold report and address with user departments. Um, our action plan responsible party is the finance department accounts payable. And our, our action plan step is to establish procedures to monitor invoice on hold report. And uh, those operating procedures are being developed to minimize the invoice on hold causes. Um, the invoice on hold report um, at times I would suggest can be um, a, a symptom, if you will, of, of other findings. Um, and I think as, as I think we've made, and I should say we, but the county has made really good progress in addressing the invoice on hold report, uh, managing down the numbers that are on that report, um, has developed a process to monitor on a regular basis, uh, communicate with user departments effectively regarding invoices that are not making it through the processing, uh, and to uh, uh, address other audit findings that are causing invoices to stall in the process. Um, so I think this is an area where good progress has been made by the county. Okay. Um, audit finding number seven, invoices processed prior to an approved purchase order. Um, the recommendations that finance management establish procedures for purchase orders to be processed and approved prior to an invoice being accepted for processing. And then finance and purchasing and contracting work together to educate user departments and to implement monitoring procedures to identify non-compliance. And so our established action plan is for accounts payable and purchasing and contracting to develop updated procedure documentation for the purchase requisition and order activities. And so there is a process, there is a uh, fairly sophisticated um, um, enterprise resource system that's utilized to process the, the county's activities. Um, and that process needs to, needs to require the, uh, the completion of a purchase order and a training on that updated uh, procedure documentation to be provided. Um, a reporting process to identify personnel needing additional training as that process is implemented. Um, and accounts payable to identify recurring invoices, which purchase orders may not be utilized and to make sure there is a uh, an effective process established for those. The responsible party is accounts payable in purchasing and contracting and, and that process and those training materials are in development. Finding number eight, user departments not always compliant with standard operating procedures. 
So a, a process, the recommendations, a, a process of communication for accounts payable to update its procedures manual to include specific guidance for user departments. Um, user department uh, training as part of the annual training um, to implement user, the AP management to implement procedures to effectively communicate and contact user departments when invoices are received that do not comply. So we're ensuring that we're working together, we're training, and we're communicating. And AP management to report the results of, of this monitoring process uh, to the user departments to uh, help design ongoing training for areas where user departments may not fully understand the, the procedures to uh, efficiently and effectively process an invoice and a payment. So our action plans are surrounding those to, to develop this procedure document, which is uh, underway. Uh, to include uh, training on the initial procedures and annual training, um, AP management to establish a process to contact user departments regarding invoice and processing. That is, that is already uh, uh, underway. AP management to assess ongoing processing, design training. The responsible party is accounts payable and, and all of those things are in process. Audit finding number nine, access controls for the AP module need improvement. Access controls uh, are a, it's an IT term of uh, users and their ability to access a, a user or a user department or a person in the user department or accounts payable, their ability to access accounts payable or invoice processing information. Uh, the recommendation for finance, AP management and IT to work together to implement policies and procedures to address um, deficiencies or, or to design compensating controls to reduce user access risk. Finance management access controls to uh, implement access controls to identify and train data owners and provide for a periodic review of active users. Established action plan, it's AP and DOIT to develop the procedures uh, for training for data owners and AP and DOIT management to deliver a process for review of active AP user roles and permissions. So that's a, a process of, of action plan owners for Finance AP and Department of Information and Top Technology that is in process. So there, for, for example, here, there is a process um, at new hire, there's a process of communication and termination. And so there are processes in place and this really gears more towards understanding the, or getting the data owners um, um, act, active involvement in assuring that a person has been authorized access. So those are the, the nine audit findings. To, to add to the, to the end of that and answer any questions you have, a, a couple of things that I'd, I'd wanna point out, um, each of these findings, um, they, they build on each other and there's an interrelationship here. And so we're addressing these findings together and, and not together, but the, addressing the findings together because they're, they're interrelated. And our goal is to uh, not only identify where we need to put the controls, but to take those controls and put them in a clear manner in which we can train, communicate and train that information and help users and others understand that this is how uh, it, it, it works for effective internal control and oversight. And so we need to get it to a point of uh, not just designing the controls, but putting in a clear and legible manner where we can communicate it and use it as an ongoing training process. So I think where we are in the process is identified the areas where action plans are needed to address each of the findings action plans are in process of being implemented and those action plans as they're being developed are being put into a procedural document that we'll use for the operating procedure and for training. So we're, we're at that in the level of implementing the action plans and putting it into paper to communicate and train. So I'll stop there. If, if there are any additional questions that I can answer, I'd, I'll be happy to do so. 
I have one question, and that is to you, uh, both you and Mr. Campbell. This um, particular audit focuses on a relatively narrow area of the entire purchasing process. Um, I'm wondering um, to what degree, um, Mr. Campbell, you believe that uh, you know this particular line of improvement is uh, sufficiently comprehensive to um, fully uh, evaluate the integrity of the process as a whole? Well, definitely the accounts payable process is a significant um, part of it. But um, another thing that we're currently doing is to follow up on a, the purchasing policy audit that was done some, uh, I believe, more than a, a year ago, a year or so ago. And I believe that those recommendations in, the, in that particular audit will help address a number of the other purchasing issues that we have observed. Thank you. So, so I'm currently working with um, C CEO Williams and with um, the Chief Procurement Officer to review the the recommendations in those in that report to determine what um, you know policy revisions should should be made. Thank you. Are there other questions, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? So Commissioner Carkin Johnson hand was up. Are oh, you? I'm sorry. I uh, I'm having her hands up. I'll, let her. Uh, I'll let her go first, and then you. Let's see if her uh, mic's better. Uh, am I better? You yes. Are. Yes. Good. Good. Um, I, I have so many questions. I hope I can remember everything. But um, in terms of and Mr. Um, Johnston, are you an independent contractor or are you a part of DeKalb? Are you uh, what office are you out of? I'm an independent contractor. I'm a vendor. OK, so. understood. Um, I, I just wanted to understand, you know, your role. And Certainly. initially, I'm sorry, go right ahead. No, I said certainly. Yes. I mean, now, Nichols Call Collie is a uh, C is a CPA firm that goes out and does audits and everything. On they audit, in fact, our pension system, which is not something Mr. Johnston was looking at um, because that wouldn't be independent. But for our system, um, you know, we Malden and Jenkins is our outside auditor, and we requested to have somebody independent come in, and but, but they are a very a highly qualified CPA firm. Understood. Now, um, one thing that I didn't hear, and I just want to make sure, um, because, you know, a lot of the issues you raise, um, I'm not sure I understand that you're in the process of evaluating and creating practices to ensure, or like, I guess we would say what would be best practices. But does any of this have to do with the current or existing technology that is in place? And are there any recommendations for upgrades there? I don't think I would have um, the you have a you have a fairly sophisticated Oracle system. Um, and I don't think that while I'm not an I'm not an IT expert. And so I don't mm -hmm. think I could uh, recommend whether or not you have sufficient IT technology. Um, but the IT technology, from what I've seen of it, and, and we've looked at a good bit of it in looking at the, the um, vendor management process, the requisition process, the uh, um, purchase, the, the establishment of a purchase requisition, a purchase order, a receiving report, uh, those accounting documents. Uh, from an accounting and control perspective, um, those documents are relevant and in place in the system. And so I don't think it's a, a system limitation per se um, that would need an upgrade. Okay, thank you for that because I, I needed to have faith in the system because for me, um, I assume that if people aren't performing, they don't have access or capability to what they need in order to generate the reports and or patrol for many of the things that you've mentioned. Now, one of the things you, you said here is a purchasing advisory committee, and I had never heard of such. So this is a recommendation that you're making that we have a purchasing advisory committee. Is it, and if you'll just answer that yes or no, then I'll know if I have another question. That is not a recommendation I made. Okay, so explain what it is, because uh, on one of your sheets, you mentioned a purchasing advisory committee. 
there is a, and, and I may use the wrong terminology, there is a county policy that requires the establishment of a purchasing advisory committee and the audit um, performed by the Office of Internal Audit identified that the purchasing advisory committee had not been established and was not functioning. Understood. Um, I know we, we were reviewing the committees, um, COO Williams, because we had many committees here in DeKalb County that exist and they're just headless horses. Some of them are headless horses that make no sense. Absolutely. And there, there were to be recommendations made to us. Mm -hmm. um, did this purchasing advisory committee, um, did, it, did it survive or is this a committee that we don't have functioning because we don't think it's necessary? So, an uh, excellent question, uh, Commissioner Cochran Johnson, and that um, probably leads to another conversation where we can have P3, which is the firm that we are um, hired to do the, the work that you just mentioned, the uh, review of uh, com committees and commissions and boards. Um, that work is ongoing. Uh, I think they began maybe 30 days ago, and I believe we anticipate a report out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we can provide a formal presentation of, of that, you know, this specific answer as well as others. But thus far, I've not received any reports back from them because uh, you know, we're just not there in, the, in their scope of work. But excellent question, because that work is ongoing. Understood. And, and you know, for me, you know, I, I understand the nature of government, but you don't need a purchasing, by, in my opinion, I want to, you know, I'm open and I, I would ask to see what the description is for mm -hmm. committee members, what, uh, what, what functions they perform, because a purchasing advisory committee, that just sounds like a, a to me, a minutia, because you just need a good purchasing department and you need good operating procedures and we need a system in place. And I don't know because I'm feeling some form of detachment from understanding how these applications aren't subject to any form of secondary review, which would catch the omissions um, and the lack of signatures um, on certain documents before there's an approval. I would think that everything there has some form of human eye that looks over it. So if there's a rubric or, if, you know, in some instances, you know, in terms of uh, conflicts of interest, I don't care what county you go to, that's standard. That should be something that is automatic for each and every person that is applying or, or going through the process. But I, I have to ask too, because we all know if we've request uh, POs that, you know, we're dealing with quite a process around here in terms of getting things done. And it just leads me to ask on the accounts receivable and payable side, are we healthy? Are we, I'm sorry, ma'am, are we? Are we healthy? Do we have uh, a great deal of, of invoices that are out? Because when you hear this, I don't know if we have, you know, and I'm not trying to create an issue that doesn't exist, but is any of this something that is systemic? Do you know, are are we healthy in terms of our accounts payable and, and receivables? And and when I say healthy as a general rule, you should be able to pay your debt. And that's something that I know when we're going through the you know, the process of making awards and such, some of us as commissioners have made requests for spending allocations that are approaching a year in terms mm -hmm. of some of our funds. Mm -hmm. But I would like to believe that we are paying vendors. Honestly, folks should be paid within 90 days. Oh, sure. And if we're not doing that, then shame on us. So that's what I'm asking you. Yes, yes. So we're, How we're are we in terms of paying people? Yes, and I, I don't. I think the vast majority is like net 30 on our pay, our, our uh, you know timeline for paying vendors. Uh, so yes, the simple answer is that. Uh, notwithstanding the, the ARP challenges, and I, you know, we can deal with that separately because those are very real, but that represents about $10.5 million of hundreds of millions of dollars that we spend annually, uh, Commissioner. Um, so the, the, system, the system is more than healthy. Um, we can provide a specific um, metrics and report back. I mean, because we to define the health of our system, we would look at a whole host of things, not the least of bit, uh, not the least of which is the uh, 
know, time for paying uh, bills and things like that. Um, so I can just answer the broad question broadly with a yes. Um, annually, you know, that we're audited. I can't think of findings that deal with, uh, with uh, you know, that system. Um, so, Commissioner, I can I can tell you that we are healthy, um, and one of the reasons why we undertook this um, was probably something that that was um, concerning me since I got here, and that was the time that it seemed to take to get vendors paid. I would get phone calls about somebody not being paid. Um, and when I began to look into it, what I found was that um, either we didn't have a requisition or we didn't have a PF, we cannot pay an invoice until we have an invoice, a requisition, and a purchase order. And the reality is a purchase shouldn't be made until a requisition is created and a purchase order received. And then the invoice should come directly to our accounts payable office. And once those three things are matched, our system pays automatically. But if the terms are uh, 30 days, once those three things match, that check's going out in 30 days. But our department finance cannot initiate a requisition. We cannot generate a purchase order all we can do is process rec uh, the invoices based on the data, the background data, the backup data that we receive. Uh, and, and the other reason it's really important to go to, to, to have that step-by-step -step process is that, um, that the creating the requisition is what ensures that that money is still in the budget uh, and still available to be utilized. So that's one of the, the critical areas of the process. And the reality was, I think we were getting over 50% of our invoices were dated and effectively received, but dated prior to the requisition and the purchase order, which means we had a tremendous amount of purchases um, that were not going through the purchasing department prior to purchase. They were just, it, you know, if it's something that's under a certain amount, it sort of processes through automatically. But it, but the again, we cannot pay something until we have all three of those documents and all three of those documents match. And so I found that that was part of the holdup was that we wouldn't get, you know, people would have invoices sent directly to the part, department instead of directly to us. Uh, things like that were happening. And so what we felt like we needed was a good, solid uh, set of uh, standard operating procedures and a better um, training program so that we could train all the folks out in the departments that are the ones creating those requisitions. Those requisitions are, are created out in the departments and not by, not by purchasing and not by accounting. Um, so I think that we're headed in the right direction. I think things are already beginning to improve um, and are being processed from a payable standpoint. So long as the, the requisition gets created, the purchase order gets created, and oh, by the way, you do have to follow up and indicate that whatever that you receive, whatever you, whatever you purchase. So all those things have to happen, and then, then it pays. And that's like standard accounting. Okay, and thank you for that. Um, because, you know, when you hear these things, I don't know if there needs to be alarm, but I do see and understand that there needs to be a better process in place. So um, that being said, I, I think that answers all my questions. And I do believe, Mr. Johnston, um, your report was sent over, if not uh, COO Williams. Um, please see that it was because it's heavy in content. And it's one of those things where it's almost very hard to just sit in committee and look through it uh, because it takes time to digest what you're reading, especially with so many bullet points and so many points of recommendation. So thank you so much. Sure. And then, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, go ahead. 
here okay. or when you get your Just a question for you, Mr. Johnston or, or Mr. Williams. Do you all recommend a navigator to get through this process? Because you, you're, using this, you're using finance and procurement, but I'm trying to find somebody who can help us to see that all of the things that's recommended will be implemented and then having some type of timeline back because if you just putting them into the departments, I know I heard from finance director McNabb, but how do you, you need, seem like you need to have a dedicated person who can, can get through all of this. Well, my, my thoughts on that, uh, Mr. Johnson, is the process that we're doing right now, um, which is we have a concern. Um, so we, uh, request, you know, sometimes we conduct an audit. We've requested an audit in this instance um, to help us identify the, the issues of concern. Okay. Um, and, and then hire someone who can dedicate themselves solely to assisting us in, you know, coming together and work on these identified issues, nine issues uh, in this instance, um, and redesign the system or tweak the system as necessary, um, identify if necessary, whether there's technological issues, as Commissioner Cochran Johnson has, has mentioned, because historically there had been some challenges where, um, although we've had a robust Oracle system, um, there have been times where we didn't use it to its full uh, capacity. So I think, I, I don't think it's hiring a specific navigator if that's an ombudsman type position. Yeah, czar, some type of czar or some, but if yeah, you get no, the, no, I, I think, I think the, the the positions are here. It's just, you know, doing this work, you know, and it's the work really in all of our business units where it's time to, you know, every now and then step back, look at our processes and see how we can make them better. Did you, did you recommend Mr. Johnson, some best practices, promise approaches from other businesses or municipalities, <laughs> or you just looked at our system and found ways to tweak it up? to improve it. Did you recommend anybody they go look at some other systems or anything? Well, and if I could, Commissioner go ahead. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson was brought in after the audit was conducted. We asked for the audit to be conducted by um, the Office of Internal Audit. Okay. Uh, they listed out findings and then we hired a professional, a firm and a professional, Mr. Michael Johnson, to assist us and managing our way through it. And I, I just think that's a, an effective approach, quite frankly, bring in yeah, expertise. Cause that, yeah, because I'm listening to what you're saying. Normally the audit is done and they find some, but you were proactive to say we exactly. need help and how exactly. to exactly. come in and do a performance audit to help us get a better system. Okay, yep. thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Commissioner Patrick has his hand raised. Oh, Commissioner Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Less of a, a question and more of just a comment. Um, having been through uh, working, working as a bureaucrat, uh, having uh, management look through your processes for improvements, it, uh, this does sound like that's what's happening with all of these findings right here. And it was not specifically stated, but I think what I'm hearing is, is we're working towards an enhanced level of service for the commissioners as well as through the process. And if, if, if I heard that correctly, then I wanna say thank you very much for this. That's uh, very important. Um, um, sometimes a perspective change on, you know, what is the level of service that our residents or our businesses expect is a, is a good measuring stick to measure ourselves by. And uh, if we're moving in that direction, thank you very much. That's thank exactly you. Uh, do you have a response, I guess? Yes, uh, Commissioner Rader, I was just saying uh, Mr. Patrick hit the nail right on the head. I think that's exactly what this is about, uh, both this uh, and the next audit that we were talking about. Either we conducted it or we requested it uh, in order to improve our business processes and improve our, sy our systems, um, ultimately for the benefit of the citizens that we're here to serve. All right. Um, Commissioner Cochran, John. Yes, um, understanding that, you know, days turn to weeks, weeks turn to months. And this report was initially sent or developed quite some time ago. And I know that we've dealt with COVID and other issues, but I'm wondering 
Um, how long? Because what I'm hearing is SOPs are needed, standard operating procedures. And as much or to what extent the system allows or has the capacity, there ought to be automatic triggers where as people are submitting material, um, there ought to be, a, in essence, almost a hard stop where you can't do one thing until you've done the other. Uh, and that is not what I'm hearing here. And a lot of systems have that, so that's not unreasonable. But my, my main question is, how long, because we've been knowing this now for a while, before we have the development of the SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, to ensure best practices um, that are presented to us. Um, and I, I pose that question more to COO Williams um, in terms of a timeline here. So, and I'm, I'm going to, and I hate to, to punt this, but uh, Mr. Johnson, if you could speak to that, because we're tracking, Commissioner, based on what we presented to FAB when the audit was presented, I want to say six months ago. Again, these are numbers from my memory. Um, and we said we were going to go hire someone to assist us and get to work putting together teams and working on each of the findings. And that's what's been happening. And that's what this report represents. Um, but Mr. Johnson, if you want to speak to that, um, because you're contracted exact to do exactly that. It is those, the, so the, standard operating procedure, if you will, um, is, is being developed by me, my team, uh, Lisa, um, controller Lisa Andrews, CFO McNabb, and, and the accounts payable department. So it is, it is in process and underway. Um, and with training materials to go along with that, I, I would like to see, but I hate to, to give dates because we want to get it right, but I, I suspect within the next two months, we should have a very good uh, document developed. That that would be, I think, a reasonable goal. And Commissioner Thank Johnson, you. just to reassure you, um, we have SOPs and we have training materials that actually already set forth that process, requisition, PO, et cetera. But what we have found is that the county has deviated from that process so that the hard stop you were speaking of that says you can't go any further mm -hmm. is that we will not pay an invoice unless those other steps are completed. And that has slowed down the process of getting vendors um, paid. And so what we wanted was better, more expansive SOPs, better training, updated training for new people so that this process will occur in the order in which it should occur and therefore will allow our vendors to be paid more timely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for that. All right. Any other questions on this particular uh, presentation? All right. Um, I am going to uh, have to leave the meeting early due to another commitment. So I would ask if uh, perhaps Commissioner Cochran Johnson could um, manage uh, the meeting until 5 p.m. It may be that given the extent of these, we may have to defer a presentation on the financial statements. Um, but before we go to code compliance, um, could you just please tell me if there are any other, uh, any new, uh, um, developments within the context of watershed debt offering either the refunding or the um, new debt uh, proposed to be offered to public sale. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Chair, I don't think there's any new, nothing new to report. All right, no new developments regarding that. All right, that's what I needed to know about that. Um, Commissioner Cochran Johnson, um, if you don't mind, if you would please uh, take it from here and um, uh, get as far as you can through the agenda, I would appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you. We will move right along in the essence of time. And the next thing I see listed is a code compliance audit. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with and has heard about the audit. And I do see that we have Mr. Hardy. I do know also that CEO Thurman has spoken on this issue as he explained the difference between code compliance and code enforcement. 
So at this time, Mr. Hardy, I'd say that the floor is all yours unless there's someone else here to speak. And I do see the finger of COO Williams. So I'll recognize you first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what do I, I would like to do is give uh, uh, Mr. Campbell an opportunity uh, just to walk through the findings. Um, and what I would envision um, is much like the last discussion, Yet again, uh, this original audit uh, was actually conducted not by the Office of Internal Audit, but by the uh, uh, auditors that work in the finance department. Uh, and this was, again, uh, much like the last discussion, one of our efforts to evaluate our systems where we uh, either anticipate we may find weaknesses or just want to improve. Uh, we believe that we're on a journey uh, from good to great. Uh, and what we have found in um, the audit uh, that was conducted and what uh, Mr. Campbell will walk through is, uh, you know, in many instances, a challenge that this was a question you were asking in the last uh, conversation related to technology, a technologically challenged system that uh, made it uh, difficult to get the work done. But as we will be able to demonstrate over time, the staff and the uh, overall organization, the administration and the board found ways to actually deliver in spite of the technological challenges. So if Mr. LeBlanc can walk the board through the findings, uh, then we can talk through Madam Chair, how we anticipate dealing with those issues. And in, in some instances, it's gonna be much like the last one. We identify the problems and then we find ways and we fix it and we get the work done. So that is our narrative that we would be happy to present after Mr. Campbell uh, presents his uh, information. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Williams, and thank you, uh, Commissioners. Bring my slide up. So, just uh, as uh, Mr. Williams uh, mentioned earlier, this audit, the report that we issued was issued in March 11th, um, 2022. However, it, there was also another audit that was done back in 2017 by the administration that took a look at the code compliance process. So as a part of our audit in, 20, um, in 2022, we do report on the, um, the, the status of uh, whether or not those recommendations from those issues from 2017 have been addressed. But in addition to that, we this was more than just a typical follow-up on the, um, you know, the findings that were noted in the, in the 2017 report. We also took a deep dive and look at the internal controls over the complaints submitted to the Code Compliance Administration, just trying to get a sense of, you know, are there sufficient controls in place to, to adequately handle those complaints? Are the complaints um, being handled as per the, the, the policy? We specifically looked at um, activities between January 1st, 2019, onwards to March 31st, 2020. And essentially, you know, took a look at the, the ordinances, the policies, tested, selected a few samples of um, complaints, code compliance complaints, just to see, see exactly what the process was once those complaints were, were made. Were they handled correctly in a timely manner? Were they closed um, on a, in a timely manner, for example? And trying to identify, you know, where there were control gaps, things that prevented the system from working the way how, how, how we expect it to work. So as the audit identified seven findings, or what I like to call opportunities for improvement. <clears throat> the code of compliance in our administration, they are doing some work. They are working on closing cases and there is a process in place. However, like with any system, there are opportunities for improvement. And in this case, we strongly believe that you know, if these findings or these opportunities are addressed, then you know, this would definitely help the administration in moving forward in terms of being more effective in the code compliance. Overall, I, I can say that the administration has, management has agreed to all the findings in the report and have committed to, to continue to implement um, systems and 
processes, for example, they're currently revised, and I believe Mr. Williams would go into a bit more detail as to what actions are currently underway or plan to address mm -hmm. fines. And typically, as part of our process, we typically uh, um, you know, trust but verify. So after a few months, usually between six to 12 months, we will revisit to do a detailed follow-up to, to assess whether or not those action plans have actually been in, in, implemented by the administration. So just to quickly go over the findings. Finding one looked at, and this is a repeat finding, it looked at the standard operating procedures um, for, for the um, code compliance. And we identified that the, the policies are currently in draft. And that was a finding that was noted back in 2017. And that there were also certain specific um, best practices that we were expecting to see even in the draft document that, are, that were not present. So things such as, for example, you know, guidance around issuing warnings, court summons, handling urgent situations, uh, handling complaints and violations that remain um, unresolved, and you know, how to properly close, close out case, um, case records. However, we are aware that the administration is currently in the process of revising the policy, and they did note that one of the things we, they were waiting for is, to, is for the results of this audit to ensure that they have adequately addressed all the um, concerns within the revised policy. For finding two, we noted that performance measures for the organization itself you know, were not in place to evaluate the effectiveness and the efficiency of enforcement operations that um, employees have not received written performance appraisals since 2010, and that about 20% or 3,000, and this is an approximate number, 3,080 or so open cases were open for over a year, with at least 57% of those open cases had no documented activity on the case um, filed, you know, had no documented activity on the case since the initial inspection. Now, I, I, I have a question. Sorry, go ahead. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to interrupt, but um, COO Williams, you sort of started down this road when you started to speak. Because mm -hmm. like uh, some of us, you know, we see things, we learn about it on the news. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my first time hearing that DeKalb County's code compliance office had, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. I believe you all indicated that there were 10 different systems trying to communicate in different ways. Um, Is that correct, Mr. Williams? Yes, Madam Chair, I believe it's four. Um, four. I believe it's four systems with a few manual processes thrown in, I don't want to say thrown in, a few manual processes in between to get data and information from one system to another system. And so possibly where you're going with it, and I know that, that you are very mindful and, and technologically uh, savvy, this whole issue, primarily in terms of this, this audit and the findings, rests on the fact of a lack of integration, a lack mm -hmm. of systems that were actually designed for these purposes, and then manual inputs in between these systems um, that make it very challenging to stay on top of data. The work still gets done, but you know, and, and I, I don't, I can go on all day on that, Mr. So I'll let Mr. Campbell fin finish, but yes. You, 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 yeah, absolutely. And, and now where this leads me is this initial report that I heard of it predated me, and I think it arrived at the time, perhaps, that Mr. Hardy did, because the first mm -hmm. date I saw was 2017, mm -hmm. where ultimately these things were pointed out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know that we're addressing the issue of technology, but I really want to hear where we are there, because I know as a commissioner, and I'm probably not alone, Code compliance and sanitation are the areas where I receive the bulk of my calls from constituents. And there's no reason we should not have a system where we, even as commissioners or even the general public, 
Because at the end of the day, we need to empower people to understand where they are in the process. Because you have numbers here that show 20% of open cases were open for over a year. A person doesn't know where, where, they, where it is in the process. They just know that they haven't seen action on the issue. And for them, that means that we, that's when your issue or <laughs> becomes ours, has not been addressed and they mm-hmm. hold everyone in the pipeline accountable. Absolutely. So I, I want to hear from you that whatever we're considering here is a system that brings all of these four things together and that allows easy accessibility so that we can stop receiving duplicate requests for the same service simply because people have seen no action and it remains in progress. And Commissioner Larry Johnson, I I saw your hand. I'm going to let you ask it before you bother responding to me on that. But we need a system that, 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 that works here where you can track what's going on in real time. When people receive a call or there's an update, it is not hard. You know, web developers can do this. Everything should be in one central portal. It shouldn't be that we're reading here that there's no documentation. And, and you know, it's a disservice to Mr. Hardy. And I say that because I know how hard he works. And you have to give people the tools they need to do the job. Uh, and Commissioner Larry Johnson, I'm recognizing you at this time. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Johnson. I, if when Commissioner Larry Johnson is done, I do want to give you uh, information, background, and context on the concept of open cases. So, if Commissioner Larry Johnson, your question relates to that issue, um, I have more information that I think would be helpful to you all. I just didn't. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Commissioner Larry Johnson. I just didn't want to waste your time. No, I, I want to ask because Zach said you got four different entry points when I'm trying to figure out how could you have four different entry points and because you're using one system and then Mm -hmm. at some point, where's the quality control? Because somebody not, you know, not at the uh, Mr. Hardy level, but just in between Mm -hmm. should be checking to see if the case is still open, if it's closed, it should be still some people checks in the middle of the, the computer inputs. So how do you have four different systems when you really only had one? It just seemed, it just helped me with that because it seemed like the person who's the code enforcement officer put it in, that means another code enforcement officer may be using a different system. Mm-hmm. Well, in different components, it, you have to look at it it's kind of linear, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, beginning with that uh, code enforcement officer that goes out and takes pictures and um, you know does a certain amount of data entry. And at that point, I think you have two different systems. And what I would like to be able to do, um, if, it, if, if we would allow Mr. Campbell to go through his findings, we're gonna come back to this issue. And actually Mr. Matowski is prepared to walk through and I literally, I'm looking on my wall. I have it, I don't know that we have time to go through that, but I have a large uh, flow chart that identifies where the systems interface, where they don't interface, uh, where there's manual entry or manual processes, and understand that although it starts with the uh, Mr. Hardy's team members who go out and take pictures and, and, and start the process, it has to end in the court system that has, of course, a different system, um, you know, um, to process um, each case, but. Well, that, that's why I wanted you to play John Madden, where you can be on the telescreator. Well, and, and that, that's what I'm outlining. Doing. That would have been easy. I mean, I want to hear Mr. Campbell because we've heard the findings already, and you, you're going to give us some solutions. But I'm looking for the solution part, and the solution so, part for me is the just the visible flow mm-hmm. chart on where the four disconnects and how you're looking at the new system to merge and to get and make sure we don't have these backlogs. So, mm-hmm. Madam Chair, I'll hold up and I'll let them finish, but I, I'm more interested in the flow chart uh-huh. visual piece. Right, and, and, the, and the timeline, because that's yeah, gonna be first quarter, first, first quarter 2023 is, is you know, if, if, we, if we had to skip to the last chapter of the book, that's where it all comes together, but Mr. Campbell. All right, thank you. Let me uh, 
So for finding three, this is again another issue related to, to the processes where, where the policy says one thing, but the system was not fully aligned with the, um, with the county policy um, as it relates to the priority levels assigned to cases. So you may have a, a situation where the policy says, you know, critical, that cases should be assigned a priority level of critical, high, medium, or low, where in the system itself that managed the cases, that documented the cases, uh, only three priority levels were available. So as a result, we identified that about 89% of the open cases had no priority level assigned to them. And of course, if no priority levels are assigned, then you know, that may affect the, the appropriateness and the timeliness of mm -hmm. the um, enforcement activities. For finding four, inspections were not performed within the required timelines. And these, this was a repeat finding, something that was noted in the 2017 Finance Department audit where the initial inspections were, for cases were not uh, completed within the 72 hours as required by policy. Our inspections were not completed within the 15 day timeline required by the, by the policy. Finding five documentation to support the investigations was missing from the, from the Hansen application files, the case files maintained in, in Hansen. And again, this is another repeat finding that was noted in the 2017 audit. So, you know, in terms of the supporting documentation is really just to support um, the, the case, the, the investigation of the cases, things like photographs, signatures of, of the investigating officer, certain key documents were not present on the, um, within the case file. Finding six, Systems and processes for sharing case data between the courts and code implies administration needs improvement. And I believe Mr. Williams alluded to this earlier in terms of the, the opportunity to improve integration of certain key systems. So, you know, in this particular case situation, if cases were, when cases were um, referred to the county magistrate Mag court for resolution, that the outcome of that case was not necessarily um, recorded or updated within the, the Hansen system. So the system may reflect the case to be open. It may have been resolved. It may, it may be delayed in the court, but the, the, the case management system, the Hansen system would, would not capture that information because of the lack of um, integration between those two systems. And even from a manual um, perspective, there was no compensating or alternate um, manual process in place to ensure that the that the most accurate and the most up-to-date information as it relates to the, to the cases um, um, were actually um, in place. The last finding, finding seven, relates to the, um, the ease of access of information through the website, the accuracy of the code compliance, um, uh, well, the accuracy of the information about code compliance administration itself. And again, this is another repeat finding that was noted in the 2017 audit where the information primarily on the county website is outdated and, and inaccurate and provides um, you know, out-of-date information to the public. In addition to that, it does not currently in its current state, it does not allow the public to easily obtain information about the status of um, complaints that have been filed. But overall, as mentioned before, I, you know, Mr. Williams will go into a bit more detail about the action plans that the county has in place to address these findings. And you know, I'm welcome. I'm, I'm happy to come back to the um, to the committee a few months from now to report on the follow up activities to in terms of determining whether or not those action plans have actually been implemented and the um, whether or not they have been effective. Okay. And, 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 and I thank you for what you're saying. I know we need an action plan, but I also understand we need functional software. We need a good system. Uh -huh. Talk to us uh, about what we're doing and what type of system. Has there been any determination made on a software packet that will allow us to better manage, disseminate, communicate 
and reveal in real time where we are with issues that are related to code compliance. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. I'll refer to Mr. Uh, Williams. Right. Yes, and, and what? And I apologize because uh, Ms. Ernst has had the floor, and I kind of, you know, uh, did you have a, a something, Ms. Ernst? And then because yes, I, I, Commissioner, I want to turn it over to Mr. I, to talk about. Mm -hmm. So, Commissioners, before we move on to solutions, I would like to draw your attention to two particular distinct issues. And it relates to, I think it's finding number four and finding number six. It is the concept of open cases. As we discovered what was occurring, there is both a technology issue, but there is also a long standing issue related to the term open. So, open cases until the technology gets in place and the data is scrubbed, and I don't mean scrubbed, but corrected in some way, open cases can involve cases that are barred by the statute of limitations. Open cases can be cases that are no longer in code compliance, but have been forwarded to my office to file for civil in rem proceedings. Open cases include cases that are no longer in code compliance, but are in magistrate court and the solicitor general's office. Open cases include cases that have been decided by the judge, but demolition has not occurred. And so there needs to be a more precise so that the public and you and we know where the status is. As we all know, code compliance is not just about one department. It requires all of the partners. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that was, it's in Mr. Williams, in response to the audit, drafted a letter um, that is on page 16 of the actual final audit report. It begins at page 16 that identifies a number of these issues. If you are wanting to look at specifics as to the county's response and its own internal investigation that it did in order to respond to this audit. And the second is just a very fundamental fact that goes, Commissioner Cochran Johnson, to your technology issue. As you all know, in most courts right now, we electronically file. That means that when we are filing documents, they are filed out of this office and they are electronically filed in the court. Right now, that is not available for the citations that go to the Solicitor General and the Magistrate Court. They are walked across the street and they are hand entered into the system. That's part of the problem that needs to be fixed because mistakes are made. I mean, it just is. I mean, it's a human sort of issue. And if they're electronically filed, mistakes are still made, but it's less. And I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that problem as we talk about solutions. So thank you, Mr. Williams. That was all that I wanted to present. And um, thank you so much for that. And, and let me say that a case that's been barred a statute of limitation, that case should not be an open case. Some of what I'm hearing here is just, uh, <laughs> we have to do better because there's some instances where it should not be called an open case. That's not an open case. Whether or not it was adjudicated, this is totally separate, but it's no longer open. Um, so all of these things, I'm sure as, as this goes through process, we'll, we'll visit and we will make corrections there. And um, another part of this, because this, could, this, this is really deep, and Commissioner Terry, I, I do see your hand. I'll acknowledge you in just a moment. You know, code compliance in itself is a process. Because when we send out code compliance, and feel free at any time to correct me because I want to operate in order and be decent in what I say and correct, um, from the time an initial citation is given for a violation, there's a 30-day right to cure. Then in 30 days, we show up, and if there has been no remediation and, and the condition has not been cured, that's when a citation is issued. Then from there, it takes on a totally different life because that person is now going before a judge. We've dealt with COVID. That was a two-year process of getting in some cases. But again, this is a long process. 
And I'm beginning to wonder, and Mr. Hardy, I know a while back we did, uh, I don't want to use an improper term, but uh, there was a uniform uh, municipal code that I believe in 2019 that was brought to DeKalb. We did some reviews there. But in some instances, I think the period of time for remediation and correction is too long. There, you know, um, I think we, we I, and I don't know, if in government it almost appears discretion isn't a good thing. But I think in some instances, if we have tall weeds and grass, it shouldn't th take you 30 days to mow your lawn. Shouldn't take you, we shouldn't give you 30 days to remove open trash and storage. Um, I think we need to really revisit the length of time that it takes because it, it makes community feel that we're non-responsive from what they see uh, because of how long it often takes to get things through the process and get action. And even we'll once that, that yes, and, and, and that's glad just, to look you know, at that. I've made notes. Please do, because some things, it just doesn't take that length of time. It just becomes disrespectful because they'll wait until the very last day to remediate condition. And Commissioner Terry, go right ahead. Commissioner, I just wanted to say one thing about the open cases before Commissioner Terry. This categorization of those cases predates Mr. Hardy is longstanding. This is not a new issue that just arise, arose or that Mr. Hardy decided to categorize cases or Mr. Williams did, or the CEO, or you all decided this is a longstanding issue. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Terry. Thank you. Um, yes, I just wanna um, thank um, everyone for um, this very detailed analysis and discussion and the reports that we're receiving. Um, uh, my, and I, I'm, I'm, I feel confident that, you know, the things that have been outlined here are, you know, the, the right way forward. So I'm excited about, mm -hmm. um, you know, improving those systems, improving the, whether it's e-filing or, you know, a better coding system. So support all that. I guess maybe uh, what I'd like to maybe see if we can just kind of hone in on is, you know, when we talk about like now that Mr. Campbell and his department have a fuller understanding of kind of what that, you know, open case might actually entail. Is there is there is it possible just to get kind of a, a you know a um, a refresher on those open cases that really just delineate here's all that are that they're not in our hands anymore. They're in the courts. Versus here's the ones that we just we're still working through. Because I think at the end of the day, all the constituent cares about is that we're working the case. And I think. The only thing that I would be concerned about is, is there X number of active cases where we just haven't gotten to a resolution yet? And then just really, you know, hone in on the ones that are the, the, the real problem ones. Because I think there's a lot of these are probably run of the mill code compliance issues, trash, litter, um, you know, car parked in the lawn on cinder blocks. You know, it could be, a, you know, it could be a host of things. Um, you know, I, I just, in my experience in Clarkston, I mean, you can do, I mean, if you really want to do a code compliance sweep, I mean, you can get down to chipped paint, signs blocking the windows. Um, those last, see those little signs that are on like, uh, that they put on, um, you know, the bollards. I'm pretty sure those are illegal. Um, you can get really, really persnickety about code compliance. But I guess the main thing I would try to hone in on is, where are the ones that are just so egregious, so awful, and and is, is there a way to triage the ones that just really require a lot of extra work? And I know we've been talking about the one down by the Metro South CID. That's probably like a prime example of like, is that case still open? I assume some of it's in the court, maybe other aspects of it or not. So I'm just wondering is like, is that something Mr. Campbell's going to do just to now that he and his staff have a a better understanding of how we're coding things. Can we kind of hone in on the ones that really are outstanding? Thank you. Well, uh, just so, so just that um, quickly, uh, Commissioner, that's a really great question. Part of the challenge during the audit was that the, the documentation of the information simply was not there for us to be able to clearly differentiate or de um, delineate between the different type of cases. So that was one of the findings in the report that the way 
the information that was maintained, the documentation that was there was that you know, it indicated that it was open, but there was insufficient information to determine what the current status was uh, for, for that particular for that particular case. And I believe that's something that they're trying to address now with the with the um, with the implementation of the new system. As it relates to how urgent cases are, that's another issue where where the priority level levels were not appropriately assigned in terms of determining whether or not this is an urgent matter versus less 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 um, less urgent complaint. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, thank you for that. And in and, and, and just a moment, COO Williams, um, you know, um, Commissioner Terry, I've never heard the term pre-snickety, but um, being as how you've used it and within the context you did, I want Mr. Hardy to be pre-snickety. <laughs> um, I personally, you know, um, I always grapple with the thought of assigning priority anywhere except as it relates to our police officers and their response time. I think when something comes in, we need to get it through the system. Um, doesn't matter if it's tall grass or um, a large pile. I think it needs to begin that day and we need to get it through the system as expeditiously as possible. Another thing that I want Attorney Ernst to note is I think we need mandatory minimum fines for certain violations. And the reason I say this is because I know that our judges have latitude in, the, uh, shall I say, the administration of justice. But I believe that justice works best when it's swift and you are assured that it will occur. And if folk walk in, and if we have for tall grass and weeds, a minimum of a $300 fine, um, you know, then, and that's your first occurrence. And then thereafter, when people come back, if they know that there are mandatory fines that are assessed um, and that it is non-negotiable, and I don't care what judge you go before, we're gonna administer justice fairly with you, um, then I think that would be a major deterrent to people in DeKalb. So I really want us to look at that. Yes, and um, with that said, I think COO Williams had his hand raised, Commissioner Terry, and then I see uh, Commissioner Johnson, Larry Johnson, I, I recognize you thereafter, followed by Commissioner Patrick. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Mr. Williams. Well, so Commissioner, what I was prepared to do is um, kind of have Mr. Matowski walk through or give an overview in, in the interest of time, because literally, you know, it's quite extensive, but give a good definition of what we're working with on the separate systems. The work that is going on as we speak, I mean, these are literally um, daily meetings, weekly check-ins, uh, with an anticipated upgrade and completion uh, early next spring. And I think that's critically important to get our, mind, our minds and arms around this issue. Additionally, I, I think that this conversation needs to clearly understand the request from the magistrate court because Mr. Hardy and his team can cite as many citations and they can be uh, as persnickety, but unless the courts have the resources to uh, adjudicate the cases, then it's just a, a larger and larger pile of cases. So, um, but what, whatever your pleasure, Madam Chair, because I know that there's several questions and I don't want to cut off the conversation. Uh, I understand. And I know there's even been conversation concerning um, revising and or redefining the role of code compliance and expanding their capacity to um, write citations. And I just don't want us, because I know that in government, one thing I found, we can get lost in the process because there's so much to be done. And believe it or not, for all of us commissioners, this is a part-time job, imagine that. Um, and it just becomes a bit much, you almost, you know, so, but this, we've had the conversation, but, you know, we have to act on it. And let me also say, too, I, I know that Mr. Hardy knows I, he's one of my favorite people because I know the amount of work you do because I know how often I reach out to you. 
I just want to see things work well for you uh, as well as me and the and the, the residents of decay. I've been Commissioner Larry Johnson. I'm going to recognize you at this moment, followed by Commissioner Patrick. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you so much. And I, I really want code enforcement to work efficiently and effectively. And I think Mr. Hardy is doing it and Brandon bring up the par, especially if you give them the tools that is needed. And I know this wasn't the tone and the intent of the conversation, but I want to make sure that uh, our law department, because I have a lot of areas going through gentrification, that the, the code enforcement doesn't become a weapon for use dealing with our seniors and then they have to and it gets them out of their houses quicker i don't want a call to be made and they keep getting calls and they on fixed income and they're trying to do it because i've seen in instances not here but what code enforcement is used as a weapon and you're trying to get folks out of their home and so taking away looking at discretion and the judges just somebody i just want you to, to see how it's done in other parts of the country, because I could see it is used if you if you do it in such a way, you use to, to go the opposite way, where we can be actually forcing people out as opposed to trying to keep them in. And so I just want to make sure we have a, a real balanced equation as we do it, because I know one size does not fit all, but I know when you make laws, you got to do it equally, and sometimes. In doing it equally, you can force people who are on the edge already uh, to be kicked out. And I don't want us to be, I don't want to create a policy where now I've, I'll, our, it's, it's forcing people out because of the fines and the harassment and things that can be perceived uh, that can be happening. And I think that's what we've grappled with through this whole code enforcement conundrum for years. That's why you had warnings put in. That's why you had certain lengths of times for people to, to get stuff done because you could not tailor it for certain people. You had to make it a general rule for 30 days or you put a warning in because you had folks who may be dealing with a sickness or maybe going through something and they can't get it done in 15 days because of illness. But you, you got to give the code enforcement the tools to be effective because you do got people that abuse it. So I'm just trying to tell you just as you design some things, um, you got to look at you're looking at the extreme, but also make sure we have a some type of way to to look at it from that standpoint as well. Because I got a lot of seniors who are getting letters every day. They will buy your house as is, and they're looking at the gutters. They say your gutter not, and they're looking at houses from the outside because they're trying to tell who are the people who may may want to sell, mm -hmm. you know, and how they're having trouble paying. The paint may be chipped. The car may be, you know, it's just a lot of things that investors and people look at that shows people may be on the edge and may need to sell their house and, and people may call. So I don't know how you work it out and how you do it, but I just know, uh, you, you know, as you balance the equation, we got to make sure we, we look at that as well as we move forward. But this is a great discussion and I want to get the tools as needed, but I just know how you can turn something that may be positive into a way that that can be forcing people out at the same time. Yes, sir. Mm, Absolutely. And, and thank you, Commissioner um, Larry Johnson, for those statements, because you're absolutely correct. And maybe in so crafting, whatever it is, is the ultimate version. Um, a senior would have the ability to check a box indicating uh, that there is a fixed income with limited capacity to renovate or remodel, something that helps them. And perhaps we as a county, um, because the city of Atlanta has a fund, and as gentrification has taken place, particularly over near the, um, the dome, as those properties were sold, it was required that a certain amount of money was set aside into a special fund and those monies are used for seniors and individuals who have issues meeting um, their, their tax liability. It, it, it just becomes a, a, a fund that can be utilized. So maybe that is something that we can visit because we, we even have a, you know, beyond our seniors, when we look even at our business community, 
the facade of many of our buildings, it must be addressed because they have aged. And when we talk about revitalization of communities, attracting industry, economic development, DeKalb has to do something. And I know government can only do so much, but this is a very big conversation. It's a necessary conversation. And I agree with you. I would not do anything that would, so, that would in any way harm our seniors. So thank you for making those statements. And at this time, Commissioner Patrick, I recognize you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the difficulty speaking after the chair, as well as uh, Commissioner Johnson is, is both of you have been around long enough and you know, you already know my stories. Uh, from my Norcross experience, we had um, uh, Gulf War veterans uh, who had uh, PST and were not able to get out um, as frequently as the code required, and it was about a 15-day turnaround time. Um, and so that led to a lot of frustration, a lot of irritation. Uh, I will say that it was well-trained code enforcement officers that were able to have more of a, a TLC approach to fixing the issues. Um, you know, the code is there as a backup. And really the idea is, is of all the agencies within government, code enforcement needs to be the friendliest, the most accommodating, the most understanding. Um, and I think as long as we have that approach, that is the first step to engaging with our residents, because as Commissioner Johnson said, we don't want to have our seniors feeling uh, um, bumped up by the government. We certainly don't want to have those who have a medical issue uh, or uh, <coughs> You know, someone's lost a job and they are just adjusting to new realities, economically speaking. Uh, the other component I wanted to add was um, um, whatever software package I know Mr. Mutowski is going to talk about, from my experience, again, something that integrates with GIS that takes your parcel data, can have your zoning history on that property, can also end up having some of your code enforcement history on that property. Um, that is very helpful. Of course, if you can integrate some police data, if there's any history of criminal activities there, that information becomes very handy. And then code enforcement's even able to have officers in the area if, in case something should go wrong, if there's a history at a location. But um, ultimately, uh, good resources on the software package. Uh, and as I've spoken with uh, Mr. Williams in the past, uh, his, his contention is the other pressure point is the court system and getting them to the resources that they need, I think is, a, is a, if that's the issue, then let's work on getting to that fix because code enforcement does need to be something that is perceived and functionally in a time frame that is reasonable to get things taken care of. Uh, you don't want to have a six month issue. Um, if you do, you want to be able to show some type of progress being made to the residents that are in the area that feel like they're being affected. So again, that's where code enforcement as a trained group comes in, uh, but also a good software package that has a process that takes it from initial complaint all the way through court resolution. Final thing I'll add is in Doraville, uh, and Doraville's sort of known for some of the code enforcement history. Um, we came up with an approach where it became a civil violation uh, as opposed to any other type of uh, way of qualifying or classifying the, the citations that get written. Um, again, that was to be a softer footprint. Uh, and really the idea is, is just encourage people to get into compliance. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Um, uh, COO Williams, I recognize you at this time. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And my comments really in large part are gonna piggyback on uh, one of the statements that you've made relative to even county facilities. Um, and what I would do is really take us back uh, to 2017 when the CEO arrived. Um, and, and he talked to the, you know, to the staff, the executives, um, in a way that uh, really opened our eyes as to you know, how we make a difference in terms of we being our government facilities. If you take a look even at uh, you know, the Maloof building and what we've done over the past uh, number of years, um, the investments that the county has uh, put into uh, mowing, uh, keep the cab beautiful, tree trimming, um, we've spent over, uh, we've invested quite frankly, over $15 million in uh, various things to deal with blight. Um, the whole concept of demolishing homes. We had never put county funds into that type of thing. 
and I believe uh, order of magnitude over 400 uh, homes have been uh, abated um, over the past several years. Uh -huh. So each of those represents a commitment from the CEO and the board and the overall uh, county to do things necessary to address the quality of life and the visu visual appeal of DeKalb County. What we find ourselves grappling with now is how can we become even more efficient? How can we trace and track our cases in a way that we can know in real time, not only as, uh, to use Commissioner Patrick's word, as bureaucrats, but as citizens, where does their case stand? And so that effort is what we're in the process of undertaking. It is simply an evolution of where we have come to um, over the past uh, five years or so. And if I could allow uh, Mr. Matowski just to give an overview of kind of what the process will be to, um, or the ongoing process to identify how the systems need to integrate and the process for identifying what the solutions will be. I anticipate over time, there will be, um, you know, uh, ongoing updates and conversations, whether it's an ops or fab or, or PECS, I don't know where it'd be most appropriate, um, but this will be an ongoing conversation um, that will have many tentacles, not only the process for, um, you know, addressing these audit findings, um, but there will be discussions of funding the magistrate court, funding the solicitor's office, fund, you know, um, and, and, and the public defender, all of these that are components here. Um, but in the interest of time, I'd love to just give uh, Mr. Matelski an opportunity to give an overview of the efforts uh, that we're undertaking with the technology. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and thank you, Madam Chair, to the committee. And I'll be as brief as possible. I will speak quickly. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. Part of the biggest challenge was that neither code compliance uh, nor DOIT was involved in the initial implementation, uh, and we were both brought in uh, after the CEO came on board. Uh, and so this was really when it was implemented way back when, I mean, like 2010 probably, it was implemented really more as a permitting system and code compliance was kind of more of an afterthought. So basically reporting, all that fun stuff that goes along with it, um, unfortunately was not there. And as, as I think the CEO and, and Mr. Williams have noted, you know, this has been a decade long issue, unfortunately. But the good news is, Mr. Hardy and I have been tasked to rein this thing in. Uh, we have now brought all stakeholders to the table. That includes permitting, planning, code, business licensing, IT, purchasing, HR, finance, law. I mean, I may have missed some, but um, we are all looking at this holistically while we also focus specifically on, on code compliance as well. I do have some good news to report. The core system, which used to be called Hansen, is now called Infor Public Sector, is actually a very good leading state-of-the-art system. We just modernized that system. We were on an older version, the older version of Hansen. It is now uh, up in the cloud and it is uh, a modernized system which will allow us to use that as our core platform. It is already integrated with our overall GIS, so that's good. Where the two other systems where we aren't integrated, however, was the or is the field inspection component as well as uh, we've discussed the court component. So think, uh, you know, Mr. Hardy and his team actually did what they could. They, they, they band-aided together a system. They went forward with a, uh, a, a survey one, two, three system, which does allow them to go out in the field and collect information, but it does not integrate back. So it has to be copied and pasted into Infor. Same thing if we get to the adjudication component, it does not get to the court system. Those things, as, as I think was discussed earlier, they're manually walked over to the courts when the courts are open. Uh, and the courts do what they need to do, and then the files are handed back when they're done. Someone from code takes them back to their office and then copies, pastes, et cetera, et cetera. So the good news is we were tasked to address this aggressively, but smartly. Uh, we are comfortable with our uh, uh, first quarter of 2023 being able to have these things remedied. We have conducted, and what Mr. Williams was referring to uh, earlier, was a complete review of the code compliance activities, and we've mapped those out at a high level. We are also looking at each of the individual workflow processes and modernizing those as well. And we are reaching out to other jurisdictions and, and talking to other folks uh, that do this for a living. 
Uh, and so we are going to ensure that both the overall processes as well as the sub processes are modernized because we don't want to just throw or fix the technology because then we'll just do you know things uh, quicker uh, but less effective and less efficient if the system has not been designed appropriately. So we are at that point now where we are uh, we have the overall all of the different uh, workflows created. We are now working with all of the team members uh, to look at how those could be modernized and made more effective and efficient. We are deploying a, another product from the Enforce uh, solution set. So it'll be a complete integration, uh, which will be their field inspection module. So we will get rid of that tertiary or maybe it was secondary system, the, the uh, survey one, two, three. Uh, we will be then have Infor's main system, Infor public sector, main permitting planning code, the overall system. We will then have the field inspection module, which will be for code compliance, but not just code compliance. We're looking at all of the other inspector uh, and field users as well. And we're ensuring that as we move forward, all of them will be able to leverage the system as it was intended as well. Uh, so the last component is the collaborations with the courts. Currently, they are using a system called Benchmark. We were looking at an integration to that system, but after discussions with uh, the court administrator uh, as well as the chief judge, it looks like they may be moving to a different system, uh, but we will work with them and ensure that whatever system, whether they stay with the current or they move to another one, uh, that we will be able to have uh, a direct integration to that system and eliminate, again, all of these paper-driven uh, uh, manual processes. And I will just close by kind of conveying that, you know, the overall mantra right now is um, accuracy, transparency, and accountability. And we, as part of that, are also implementing by the end of the first quarter a new portal that will provide access to citizens and constituents. It will be, as I believe it was Commissioner Patrick kind of alluded to, cradle to grave. They could enter uh, a complaint. Uh, they, they can then go online and check the status of the complaints 24-7, 365, as the various departments or agencies that are involved in any components of the resolutions or updated incremental steps that take it from cradle to closure, uh, they will have access uh, to that system. We are also going to build in, you know, uh, emails where people are notified and those kinds of things so that they are aware when interactions are happening and that they're, they're not just sitting somewhere. So if someone puts in a, a, a case, they're going to immediately get an email thanking them for their submission and letting them know that it will be going through the process. Um, and then also we understand that there are communities out there who may not be in, uh, a network savvy, internet savvy, or be able to access the application and we are working, and Mr. Hardy and team are working on their business processes to ensure that we can do things also, of course, over the phone, in person, mail, uh, and, and otherwise. So uh, bringing these four systems together uh, by the end of first quarter 2023, I believe will go a long way towards uh, ensuring that we do have that accuracy, transparency, and accountability. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Williams, or to you, Madam Chair, uh, for any further comments or questions. Thank you. Um, I do see the hand of Commissioner Larry Johnson, but COO Williams, did you have a statement um, first? No, no, Madam Chair, no specific statement. I, I know that uh, we have some of our partners from the justice system on, but I don't know, you know if, if you want to hear from them today or at a future meeting. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of um, partners that are key to this process that need a seat at the table. And when I hear that information is being uh, brought back and cut and paste, we need to have a system where once a matter is adjudicated or documents are filed, we are able to easily scan those items. This stuff has to go digital. Um, but first, I'm going to recognize in the order in which I see the hands, Commissioner Larry Johnson. followed by Commissioner uh, Ted Terry. Commissioner Larry Johnson, did we lose you? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just this one thing, thank you, Madam. I'm here, you hear me? I do. Just a quick question. I hear what Mr. Matowski is saying, but I think, Madam Chair, we still need to have a way to address the, the cases 
that were open or not and not been a, dealt with, or like a letter to them, some type of acknowledgement. Mr. Williams, you may have hired folks to, to comb through them and call people as many may be available, but just let people know we just didn't throw them by the wayside because we're trying to build a new system by 2023. So we need to do some work on how you go back and at least some type of customer service to let them know we got it, uh, we're working on it, so people will know that they're not just. I understand we'll and, and yes, and receive your statements because we'll again. Go back and recognize and talk to those people. Mm -hmm. Because the community, they don't understand the process. They just understand what they have not seen. And we understand the process, but it doesn't look good when, you know, even when it comes to, you know, when we talk code compliance, you know, we talk demolitions. And in 2019, we demolished over 200 structures. Now we have a, a list of almost 400, but there's someone who lives next door to many of these structures. They don't understand the process. They just know, and, and they often say to us, you wouldn't want to live in these conditions, and I would not. Sure. So we we need to 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 move here and 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 most importantly communicate because people aren't as angry when they understand. And Commissioner Terry, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I just wanted to kind of emphasize and agree with what Commissioner, what I think every commissioner has been saying about. Um, having compassion, having um, you know TLC with some of the of the issues that you know are maybe aren't as sort of you know uh, e good versus evil uh, that there might be extenuating circumstances um, that's, that's going on, and that we work with particularly our residents, um, certainly older residents or disabled residents who you know need that support, and, and, I, and I think we're doing that. Um, and I, I think you know when I think of code compliance, I think it's important to point out that it's not called code enforcement. It's called co-compliance because we're trying to see uh, compliance. And I think at the end of the day, it's not, this is not this exercise is not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be corrective. Um, but as we pointed out, there are situations where you know punitive measures are called for, but through the court system, right? And so folks are going to get their day in court. And I think you know, and I want to just kind of come back to I think we've all been discussing and acknowledging that um, our court systems, whether state court or magistrate or the solicitor general's office, providing them extra resources and support to address some of those bottlenecks um, will get to the root of a lot of what we have been, what we hear about the most. A lot of the comments this morning, again, about the, the, the animal slaughter operation. Well, we, we, we know that those are in the courts, right? So again, like, I think you know all of that is like really positive, and I'm glad that we're moving forward in that direction. I guess the only thing I would ask is, do we think that the um, the investments that are being proposed for the courts and the solicitor and things like that, are we waiting until mid year, or is there a way that we can begin to advance those, um, you know, sooner than later? Because I, I know there was a mention of hiring people and filling job positions, and I know like. Sometimes that can just be months and months in and of itself. Sure. sure. Excellent question, uh, Mr. Terry. So I want to say my first conversation was maybe a couple of, you know, we've, we've only been talking for a couple of weeks. If it is possible to move sooner, then that's what we will propose. Um, you know, so we're not, we're not specifically waiting for mid-year. I guess that's the easiest way to answer it. Um, we do anticipate even between now and mid-year, the next tranche of ARP funding. Not that that is what would be necessary. You know, we have funds, uh, we have reserves. So we're, we're talking through that as we speak. So I'm glad that you <laughs> asked that question. Um, we're going to move as quickly as possible on these issues. And if I may just add, to, uh, Madam Chair and to Mr. Williams, we are working, as I noted, and collaborating with the courts and with each of the agencies so that we are getting this stuff all mapped out as aggressively as possible so that we'll have those financial numbers as soon as we can have them, because we will need to meet with vendors and those kinds of things, especially in those cases, if they do choose to move away from their current system, we'll need some, you know, to get what the appropriate numbers will be. So we, we are collaborating along the way and, and are doing that pre 
uh, mid-year and will continue as long as needed until we have the right numbers. And then and some complexities with these issues, understand that staffing will be a major part, but then there's also technology and most importantly, maybe space, right? Um, so, but we're working on all of those issues simultaneously. And, and thank you so much for that. And I did want to say, um, as we mentioned the courts, I do see that we have with us our Solicitor General, um, Ms. Donna Coleman Scribbling, and I'm not sure if she would like to make any comments, but I did want to recognize her for her presence if she is still with us and provide her an opportunity to respond. Because of course, um, whatever may be needed, um, in order to perform these duties, uh, I think this is an excellent time uh, because we do now have resources that have not always been available as a result of CARES and ARP funding. So uh, to my Solicitor General, you go right ahead if you'd like to comment. Good evening, everyone. And yes, I'll just take a, just a few moments um, and just to let you know, Mary Bell, who is the Clerk of State and Magistrate Court, is on as well, as well as Claudia Sari, who is the Public Defender. Uh, we actually were presenting and anticipating on presenting something jointly to address receiving funding, additional funding, for some of our um, cases that are being handled in Magistrate Court. I will tell you that that funding not only addresses hiring more staff, um, but in addition to that address, having more space, because one of the issues and main issues, certainly in my office, is that we simply just don't have the space. Every time there is an added, you know, employee, that is additional space, and COVID did not make this any easier. Um, so just part of the discussions and what we were trying to prepare for was um, in ensuring that you all had that information. Um, and even in these times, and I don't know, I, I certainly don't want to speak for anyone else, even in attempting to hire attorneys at this time, it is still very difficult to get full staffing. Um, but we are, we are still trucking along and bringing in additional persons to, uh, to, to assist us in this, but simply we just cannot, we can no longer do it without having additional spacing. And so, uh, I know that the, the clerk is on and as well as the public defender is on. And I just wanted to make sure that you all knew about some of our discussions and things that we were presenting. And also I'll take this opportunity to say this is National Crime Victims Week. We are, um, we've been doing events all week. There was a great event this afternoon and we'll, you'll hear all about it on, on our website and everything. Thank you for that. And you know, I, I don't want us to rush because I know that um, you all are very important to the process. I'm not sure if we've given you honestly, um, Madam Solicitor, the time that you need in order to present. Um, but I know that if you are making a request that it is something that you deem to be necessary in order to perform your duties. Um, I don't think most folk come to us to go above and beyond. At this point, they simply need assistance in performing their duties. Uh, so I want you to have the ability to make that presentation. So what I'm going to ask, even though you've been with us for a while, um, if you can come back top of our next meeting, if you would uh, like to do that, I will ask that you are given the opportunity to present first. Um, and if you and Mary Bell, as well as Claudia can be present, um, but thank you for what, what you do. And I'll look forward to hearing what those needs are. You've already been clear in it, but let's see those numbers and where it pans out. And I would assume that you'd be seeking this during midterm appropriations. Yes, we would. And thank you for that. Um, as I stated, it is a, a presentation from, from all three entities. And so I think it, it will likely need some time to be addressed. Understood. And um, COO Williams, I believe I saw your hand. Right. And I just want to say it may be mid year, it may be sooner. I mean, so. Okay. I mean, as quickly as we can identify the resources, which. Thank you for that. And Commissioner Terry, I'm going to recognize you at this time. 
And so I just want to like overemphasize that if we are going in this direction and we have the funds available and just given the understanding that it is a difficult hiring market, um, you know, if there's any way to, you know, expedite these things before the mid-year, I think, um, you know, more the better. Wow. Understanding that it still would take time to fill those positions, but, you know, I'd hate for us to hurry up and wait and then, you know, have to wait some more. So just um, count me in the count column of doing whatever it takes to give the resources to the solicitor <laughs> and the magistrate and state courts to um, carry out the, the, the job they're doing, uh, and they're doing a great job. So um, thank you all so much for all your hard work and looking forward to um, supporting y'all as soon as possible. Absolutely. Um, uh, Commissioner Terry, we all echo those sentiments. A great job under what has been extremely difficult circumstances. So do know that it is recognized. Um, with that being said, I don't see any further hands. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I want to thank you all for the presentations that's been made. I just want to underscore the fierce urgency of now. Uh, a few years ago, um, during the uh, ML King celebration. That was the theme for the year. And, um, you know, I know, Mr. Hardy, that you work extremely hard. I give you all the credit for that. Um, and I just want us, you know, government is, is an, has been an exercise for me uh, of running in quicksand because there's so much to be done and you just don't seem to get there quickly enough. Uh, so just know, let's stay on this. Um, I won't say when to return back to committee. I'll leave that for uh, Commissioner Rader, but we'll have those discussions. And at this time, we are going to forego two remaining items that are listed, the watershed debt offering. And I know Commissioner Rader would not want to miss that, uh, as well as the financial statements until the next meeting to come after the presentation by the Solicitor General. So at this time, removing those items, is there any further issue at this moment that needs to be dealt with in the meeting? Okay, seeing none, um, and I see Commissioner Johnson, Larry Johnson is on the move. Um, thank you for joining us, and Commissioner, it's just you and I, LJ. That's so right. yeah, time, thank uh, you. if there's no further business, I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, all those in favor, show of hands and words. Just say, Commissioner. Uh, Aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Bye-bye. Yeah.